The big spectroscopy questions in A-level chemistry exams are very intimidating, but weirdly, my advice is actually to seek these out first and tackle them when you're at your most centered with time on your side. Using this 2018 OCRA specification question from paper two, I'm gonna give you a full run through of how to analyze the data, give you some tips on how to piece together the final structure and talk about layout so that you don't lose out on a level of response style mark scheme. These level of response questions usually have NMR in them. And I think this is where people then rush to because it's high challenge content. So therefore it's deemed the most important. But actually, rushing to the NMR is risky because lots of different functional groups can carry similar information and you're going to be completely overwhelmed because there's lots of elements included in the NMR data sheet that aren't actually always included in your structure. So you might be thinking that you've got chlorines, bromines and oxygens, but actually if you'd done the empirical formula first, you'll realize that it's all about nitrogen. That's not the case here as I'll demonstrate with the empirical formula analysis, but you get what I'm trying to say. So to start my analysis, I'm going to focus on the empirical formula. And as you can see here, I've borrowed a little snippet from the question that I'm going to use to do my full analysis. You'll also notice I've subheaded this section here because in a level of response question, you're rewarded by the mark scheme for a clear and logical layout to your answer. Subheadings help frame your work a bit, and I think they're a great idea, especially if you tend to be a little bit messy. Show all your working out like I've done here. You can see that whilst I've not used units, it's obvious what I've done with each stage of my calculation, and my layout is obvious. This time the empirical formula is C2H4O, and I'm going to present it that way alongside a quick calculation of its molar mass, because I know that's going to be usually quite useful straight after this. Sometimes empirical formula and molecular formula for a compound can be the same, but that's definitely not true here for various reasons, but mainly because of the next piece of data. The mass spectrum here is quite brief, but very useful. By telling us the mass to charge ratio of the molecular ion peak, and this is the snippet from the exam question, they've demonstrated to us the molar mass of our molecule, but we have to show them that they've showed us this. So to make it clear, I've used these two bullet points demonstrating my understanding that the molecular ion peak is the molar mass, in this case, of 132.0 grams per mole. Linking back once again to module two, and we remember our next step is going to be showing us that the molecular formula is actually a multiple of the empirical formula. And that applies to their molar masses too. The molecular formula molar mass is a multiple of the empirical formula molar mass. So by doing 132 over 44 and getting a value of three, we realize that what we're meant to do to get the molecular formula is take everything from the empirical formula and multiply by three. And that leads us to a molecular formula of C6H12O3. Now, before I rush ahead into the NMR peaks, I'm actually gonna consider a few lines from the exam question that are represented here below the NMR spectrum. The spectrum itself, as you can see labeled here, has been run in D2O. Now, because of proton exchange, that means I'm not gonna have any peaks for OH bonds. That would include carboxylic acids, it would include alcohols, for example, and it would actually normally include NH bonds. But since I've not got any nitrogen in my formula, I'm ignoring that. Under the spectrum, if I just move up here, there we go, we've got these two lines down here, which are really important. When the spectrum is run without D2O, there are two additional peaks with the same relative peak areas at 11 and 3.6 parts per million ppm. Now, based on the formula having three oxygens and the location of this kind of peak on the ppm scale, so if I go to my data sheet, my 11 is going to be over here and it's going to most likely be a carboxylic acid group. And then the 3.6, well, that would be in this territory here, which can include this OH band across the top because it really does just cross the whole spectrum range. I'm going to go out on a limb and suggest 
that these two additional peaks are going to be a carboxylic acid group and an alcohol group. Yeah, do you know what? I might be wrong, but at least then I'm not going into the full NMR analysis completely blind. It means I'm going in preempting what the functional groups might be. Normally, I'd get this kind of information from infrared spectroscopy, but since I don't have it, I don't want to go in without any idea of what I'm looking for, so I'm running in with this idea. Let's see if I can prove myself right. You're going to have enough experience before your exam with various functional groups to try and make this kind of assumption for yourself. So have that confidence and don't worry too much if you're wrong. If you get there and you find out that actually you've got a lot of suggestion that you've got an ester, for instance, that's fine. But here, based on the D2O information, I'm going to go out on this limb and say that I have got a carboxylic acid group and an alcohol group because that covers the three oxygens in my formula and would account for the two peaks that are being taken away by that D2O proton exchange. Now for the peaks themselves. You'll notice that actually for the NMR, I've got heavy annotations, and I'd recommend you do this too. And the reason for this is when you're doing NMR, you want to say a lot about the peaks you've got in front of you. And if you try and put this into the line by line section, you're going to end up with a very chaotic layout. Remember that this is level of response. So your well-structured and logical line of reasoning is being questioned. I would do as many scribbles and note-taking as you want here on the spectrum so that then you can put an organized bullet point together and a piece suggestion of your molecule in the full line-by-line -line layout section. Let's have a look one peak at a time at all the information we've got, starting with this one at 4.0 ppm. So what can I say about it? Well, first thing I notice is its ppm value. And that leads me to a little bit of an idea of what the piece might be. But how I got this CH3 group and how I got this CH is understood by other features of the peak. First off, how did I get this CH? How did I know that it's going to be CH? Because if you actually look at the data sheet over here, what I'm suggesting is this is going to be the kind of structure peak that's given us our peak. Definitely not the CL and the BR because I've not got either of those two in the formula. We know that we haven't got CL and bromine in there. So I'm looking at this idea here. Now, this hydrogen value is flexible, but I'm actually suggesting and maintaining that it's just going to be one. So how did I get to that conclusion? Well, it's this information here, the relative peak area. This little one value tells me that I've got one hydrogen within the piece of my structure. And so I'm suggesting that piece is just here. So what about this CH3? Where does that come from? Well, I'll get to that from the splitting pattern, a quartet. Now, you might look at that and think to yourself, right, quartet, how did you get CH3 then? Well, the quartet is achieved by the N plus 1 rule. And N is the number of neighboring hydrogens on the next carbons up. And so that tells me I've got three neighboring hydrogens on the next carbons up. So when I say next carbons, that means I could go in either direction from the current proton environment that I'm in. So from this environment just here, my CH, I could go one, dire uh, one direction or the other. But actually, based on my experience with this and a tip I'm giving to you, when you end up with an N value of three, that's most likely going to be a CH3 group. And then what's going in the other direction must just not have any hydrogens on it directly. So maybe it's got some further down the line, but that immediate connection might not. So I'm using a bit of experience once again here that I'd like to encourage you to do as well. And I'm suggesting that my CH environment is bonded to this CH3. I've got my oxygen as well, which I got from the data sheet. And what this R group is, I don't know. But let's have a look for what it could be elsewhere on the spectrum. Now, another way of checking to see if I'm right is this CH3 should be somewhere else on this spectrum. So what I'm looking for is a CH3 somewhere else down the line to my right-hand side on this spectrum that's actually going to have a splitting pattern of a doublet because that would be one hydrogen on the neighboring carbon up. N plus one gives me two, so I'm looking for a doublet with a relative peak area of three, and that will give me my CH3 group. So let's see if I can find one. Spoiler alert, I can. So let's have a look at the next peak along, and the next peak along is at 1.3. Now here we're in the CH region. This is kind of your boring branchy end of the structure, and this is going to tell us a lot about if we've got CH3 groups and things like that. It's going to tell me about the rest of the chain. It's not very functional group driven down this end. 
This peak at 1.3 ppm is well within this region, and it's got this super, hyper, mega useful 6 for its relative peak area. Six hydrogens here is usually telling me I've got two CH3 groups, and I'm going to work again on that experience. It's a singlet though, it's a single spike. And so what that's telling me is the number of neighboring hydrogens on the next carbons up is nothing. These two CH3s here, which I'm suggesting are my piece of the molecule, are bonded to a carbon that itself is bonded to no hydrogens directly. So I've got absolutely no idea what's down here or what's down there, but I know they aren't hydrogens directly. There's got to be other good stuff further down the structure. What about the peak on the right-hand side? Well, this is exactly what I wanted to find, and it's kind of what I was looking for after I did that first peak analysis. It's got a relative peak area of three. It's a doublet. It's going to be my CH3 that I identified earlier on, and it's bonded to this CH. So just to make it really clear here what I've achieved, this CH is this one here. This CH3 is that one there. And so these two environments, these two peaks here, are actually bonded side by side. But then this one, the 2CH3, is kind of out on its own, and we get that from its splitting pattern. My structure pieces that I've laid out here nice and clearly are crucial to getting some of the marks in the level of response. So as you can see on the next page, if I go down to my full analysis section here for my NMR, I have actually included these suggestions after each bullet point which details the information I found from the spectrum. First off, I've got my peak at 11 ppm is suggested to be my carboxylic acid group and my 3.6 is an alcohol. My peak at 4.0, notice I've listed all the information. I've got one hydrogen, split into a quartet, N equals three, here's my piece. Peak at 1.3, six hydrogens, singlet, N equals zero, here's my piece. Two CH3 groups bonded to something that has no hydrogens on. And then my last one, peak at 1.2, three hydrogens, split into a doublet, N equals one, one hydrogen on the next carbon up, so here's that peak, and there's the hydrogen it's bonded to. What about my final answer? Well, I've kind of tucked it down here because I ran out of space because I wanted to make sure I had a nice big spaced out layout so that you could follow everything I'm doing. But here's my final suggestion for the molecule. Actually, in the level of response masking for this question, they appear to be quite flexible. But have a look over that for yourself and I'll link it in the video description so you can go straight to it. Here I've given you some annotations of my suggestion for the molecule and this was actually their go-to suggestion for it using all of the information I've got. So let's have a look. Earlier up on the page, you might have noticed that I actually labeled up the first peak I analyzed from the spectrum as the most useful. So I drew out the little piece. I knew the oxygen was going to be bonded to something. I've suggested that this 3.6 peak from elsewhere is actually the OH group that the oxygen was suggested as part of my structure up here. So on the previous page, if I just go back, you can see here for this first peak, I said there was an oxygen based on the data sheet information saying, hey, look, there's an oxygen over here. So I did suggest that this now is the OH because I'm trying to piece together the molecule and I think, well, might that work? Let's have a go. So I think that's probably the most useful. I've then put the CH3 on that. So this whole section is actually three put together. This is three separate peaks put together. The one I can't see which does appear when you don't run it in D2O. The one I can see from the left-hand side, which was annotated in purple, and this CH3 group from the far right-hand side, which is the CH3. So what have I bonded it to? Well, I've bonded it to a carbon with two CH3s, and that's my middle peak. It was the one at 1.3 parts per million. Why did I put this one in the middle? Because I know that the carbon with the two CH3s on had to be bonded to two other either carbon or maybe even oxygen containing structure sections but i went with carbons so i put it in the middle of the chain i've then on either side got the carbons from the other section which means i've not got 
any hydrogens directly bonded to this carbon here, which is exactly what I wanted because I needed to main sure, uh, make sure that this had a singlet splitting pattern. And since I've not used it yet, uh, but I know that I've decided it's going on here somewhere, I've put the carboxylic acid group on at the very end. Now, this might not have been the right answer, but what I've done is had a go. Now, you might want to not want to do this actually in the answer space. You might want to do this kind of scribble maybe on the previous page before you do it. Or do it in pencil. Biggest recommendation is pencil here. So that then you can rub it out. Just make sure it's a nice sharp pencil, a good quality rubber so you can get that nice and clean if you need to. But I've had a go. I've drawn it out and then I've tried to label it with what I was expecting. If I then notice I've missed something, I can rub it out and have another go. But what you want to really make sure you do is not spend too long on this because you could cost yourself the rest of the exam as it's likely this took long enough already. So please don't spend too long on this section. Get a structure down, check if it's all right. But if you think you're running out of time, as long as you've got a suggestion and as long as you've got a clear layout, with your pieces suggested all the way down and all of your data analyzed, that's the molecular formula using the mass spectrum and the empirical formula using the elemental analysis by mass, then you'll be all right. Move on, come back to it later if you want. But my suggestion down here is the one they had in the MART scheme and I've labeled it up with the peak suggestions. Thanks very much for watching everybody. If you would like to watch more of my videos on organic chemistry, then make sure to click the links on screen now. And until next time, happy revising.